Well, good evening. And from wherever in the world you are, we want to welcome you to the Power Over Scoliosis patient-directed webinar live from India and simultaneously from the United States. Good evening. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here representing the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation. I'll be your event moderator today, Sukhan Shah from Wilmington, Delaware and Nemours Children's Health. And I'm so pleased to welcome our three esteemed surgeons from India. Abhay Nene from Lilavati Hospital in Mumbai, Dr. Raja Shekran from Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, and Dr. Basu from uh, Kotari Hospital in Calcutta. They are um, among the world's greatest names of Indian surgeons in spinal deformity and spinal degenerative conditions, and will serve as our expert panel, both presenting some really excellent information and interacting with our patient and family ambassadors. We're so pleased to have Sneha and her father here today as our guest patient speaker from India, and she'll share her experience with us. Some brief instructions that we have for you right now. Please use the Q&A section for submitting questions, uh, not the chat. We'll be monitoring the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar for all questions. And we'll probably answer some of the questions live, but many of our presenters' questions will be also answered through the Q&A section. So you can monitor that for your own question. This is our agenda. We'll start off with a brief introductory session on what is scoliosis. Sneha will share her patient story. We'll have a talk by Dr. Raja about scoliosis surgery safety. Uh, a talk to uh, Dr. Nene about delaying scoliosis surgery. A talk from Dr. Basu about post-op care following surgery. Um, we'll have Momita talk to us about the Cure SMA Foundation, some great work coming out of India there. And I'll be back for some concluding remarks in about 60 minutes. Briefly, I wanna tell you about the great work that the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation is doing. We're a nonprofit organization. Many of you know the Harm Study Group for our excellent research uh, investigations and outcomes. But the mission of the foundation is to better those research discoveries and advance techniques for treatment of scoliosis of children and adolescents worldwide. And this is how we are teaming up with international surgeons, such as the ones with, uh, with India today, to give you an international perspective on this condition and treatment advances. And our vision is to have a future where all children with scoliosis will have the innate ability to live happy, healthy, and productive lives, as we will see Sneha is doing right now, and her future is so bright. So what is scoliosis? How often does it happen? Who gets it? we're still at the tip of the iceberg of understanding what scoliosis is. We know the normal anatomy of the spine is made up of multiple vertebral bodies as shown here. There's a cervical or neck region, a thoracic or rib cage region, a lumbar or low back region, and that's all connected to your pelvis as the foundation of what's called your axial skeleton. And we get multiple views of a spinal curvature. This is a three-dimensional problem that we now have the ability to look at in three dimensions. And as you can see on the drawing on your right, in addition to the spinal curvature, you can see there's significant rotation and effects on the ribs, the shoulders, the low back, and the pelvis. And as we know, scoliosis comes in a wide variety of causes and shapes. Sometimes you have a congenital malformation that you're born with. Sometimes it's a developmental condition in the growth spurt. Sometimes it's due to a neurologic condition that you have no control over. It, however, always creates some sort of body shape changes that pediatricians and family members can sometimes see. There may be an unleveling of the shoulders, a difference in your shoulder blade bones or the scapula, a difference in your torso or waist asymmetry, and it can cause your trunk to shift over and your ribs to relatively stick out. The ribs can be become misshapen over time due to this significant rotation caused by scoliosis. The spine and the ribs also contain the lungs and the heart. And so in the most severe uh, conditions of scoliosis, you can get effects on the lungs and the heart. However, mild curves, which is the vast majority of patients with scoliosis have no impact. It's only the severe forms of the condition that may affect your breathing. And that's why it's important to see your doctor and realize whether your scoliosis is mild or severe. 
Fortunately, today, you're gonna to hear about the most safe, effective ways of correcting severe scoliosis so that you can return to a normal, healthy lifestyle. Fortunately, only 3% of teenagers with scoliosis get the severe form. It is most likely associated with the growth spurt. And that is why we have to check adolescents or early teenage boys and girls to see if they have the, the curve. You can be checked by your pediatrician, gym teacher, or school nurse, or even your parents. Mild curves are common. Severe curves, fortunately, are rare. And these are the scoliosis associated with other conditions. And sometimes it can be quite severe, as you see in cerebral palsy in children who don't walk. Neurofibromatosis, a genetic disease that affects the nerves, which can cause a very severe form of scoliosis. And congenital scoliosis, where you're born with several misshapen vertebra. And rather than cylinders or rectangles, they become tri triangles or trapezoids and can cause a curve as the child grows. We're going to mostly be covering adolescent idiopathic scoliosis today, the most common form of scoliosis, but you can take the treatment lessons that you learned today and apply most of those principles to the other conditions. I wanna take the chance now to welcome Sneha Swaminathan and her father, Dr. Swaminathan, to share her scoliosis patient story. Thank Sneha, um, welcome to our um, webinar tonight. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sneha is going to give a one minute talk and I'm going to do a three minute slide. Sneha, it's you. Well, hello everyone. I'm Sneha from the state of uh, Tamil Nadu, India. Like uh, uh, once my dad figured out I had a small uh, uh, feature on my back. So yeah, I, uh, I was scared and we went to uh, go, go out to hospital and um, uh, I, I was uh, uh, diagnosed with s scoliosis, but uh, once I saw uh, Dr. Rajesh and his uh, team, I felt for still, and uh, in, uh, uh, in the, the next day after surgery, I started walking, and uh, after six or eight months, I was in the stage for dance. I, yeah, so... Uh -huh. I'm I'm doing fine now, and I uh, I want to and I want to thank Dr. Rajeshwaran and his team for curing me. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha. I'm just going to uh, take a couple of minutes with these slides, and uh, I'm a doctor and a dad, and uh, uh, my experience with scoliosis with Sneha. Next slide, Praveen. Uh, it was a bolt from the blue, and I think it was bolt and screws from the blue. Uh, it was totally unexpected. As a doctor, I have not heard much about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. I was just keeping my, I was patting Sneha's back one day and suddenly surprised to find a, a big curvature. It was, it was really unexpected. And then we saw Dr. Raj Shikhar, these are post-operative photographs. Uh, next slide, please. And a very challenging few days post-op. Uh, uh, it, it was a lot of uh, stress uh, pre-surgery. Uh, but I still remember Dr. Rajshekar's quip before surgery, Swami, don't you worry. I think you would need anesthesia. We'll take care of Sneha. I think I really relaxed me completely. Uh, next slide. And uh, great strength from family. I think family support is so important. Uh, and the uh, ICU and the post-operative care was excellent at Ganga. So Sneha was walking the next day, post-op. And even uh, Dr. Rajshekar's team were really surprised about her uh, uh, recovery. And uh, next slide. And uh, this is very heartwarming because Neha was on the dance stage six months later. Uh, we couldn't even believe that she could go back to dancing. Uh, this was six months in a place called Salem where Sneha gave her dance performance. And as a dad, uh, I don't think this can be equated to anything at all. So next slide. Uh, in view of the short time, my final thoughts are this. Uh, we keep asking why me? And we think why not me? Uh, because uh, we were very lucky in a very a different way to have scoliosis, but to have Dr. Rajshaker and Ganga in the same place as my daughter had scoliosis. I don't think we could have gotten any better care than that. Uh, it was a huge learning experience as a dad and doctor as well about this particular condition. And it has certainly made us stronger over the last year. Uh, uh, we know that we can't prevent these kind of bends in the spine uh, because it's idiopathic. Uh, but I think if you're strong in the mind with excellent family support and a great teamwork, uh, I think uh, life is beautiful. There's, there's no uh, stoppage of what we can dream of. So 
We're just deeply grateful to God, uh, our family, and particularly to Dr. Raj Shekhar and Ganga team. Um, I don't think thanks is a small word for, for the expertise, the experience, and the care given by Dr. Raj Shekhar said. Um, and I really believe that early identification, uh, there's still a lot of lacuna about uh, diagnosing scoliosis. As a parent, we were clueless till uh, there was a big curvature. I think parental education is vital. I think schools must be involved all over India, India uh, so that it's a part of a routine assessment of the kid along with height, weight as well. Uh, the pediatrician should be doing it routinely. And early expert consultation is the key here because a lot of doctors are not aware of this and they give very wrong advice so that it takes too long a time by the time the child is seen. Thankfully, we had the expertise available locally. And I really want uh, all of you to count us on any scoliosis meet or awareness programs across India or in the US or anywhere in the world. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Neha. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. And Swami, uh, thanks for the comments that you made. Um, you. It's, it's great that she went through a very rapid recovery. We're using the same protocol as the United States, uh, out of bed the next day, walking, and returned to home much sooner than uh, just several years ago. Uh, the surgery has become very safe, very effective at the same time. I have to ask you, though, um, you know, Raja mentioned that you were very nervous the morning of surgery, as all parents are. How did you prepare yourself? What knowledge, what access to knowledge about the procedure and her recovery did you have? And what advice would you give to other parents about what they should do? Uh, great question. So can actually, I didn't read anything. I just saw Dr. Ross Shaker, trusted him completely. Until now, I've even not read up to date or anything on scoliosis. So I'm just so happy that I left it to the expert. I, I really think all parents, you can do your Google searches, but I don't like Google being a Google doctor for all these things. I think uh, go to the expert, trust him completely, and recovery is the rule. Wonderful. Well, that, that's excellent advice. Um, we'll move on to uh, uh, the rest of our planned program. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. Uh, so we are at the point now where we're um, going to welcome uh, Professor uh, Rod Shekran, um, who's uh, a noted uh, past president of the uh, ASSI, which is an association of spinal surgeons of India, uh, and a uh, very accomplished professor, researcher, and surgeon at Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, where he's been there his, uh, his entire career. Um, Raja, we're so uh, glad to have you today. And um, hopefully um, your talk will convince people that scoliosis surgery has come a long way in terms of safety. And we can allay most parents' fears about what their children will go through with a very complex operation. Yeah, so let me share my screen. Is it on? Can you see my screen? Okay, go Yeah, ahead. you're good. So uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sukhan, and thank you, Sneha and Dr. Swami for the excellent start. And I should start off by congratulating this organization, Power Over Scoliosis, for doing this, because I think it's a great need of the hour. Like Dr. Swami said that uh, he didn't look at the Google, but I think he's an excep exception. I mean, people try to get uh, knowledge of scoliosis because once the diagnosis of scoliosis is made and there is a huge fear and anxiety to all concerned it's just not to the patient sometimes the children are so small that they are not worried about it but parents and especially mothers and all the close relatives have a major cause and if you leave it untreated unfortunately many of these children go to the other extreme of having severe curves and we know that if you intervene in time, there is a very good option of treatment available. This is the sort of uh, good correction that you can get. It's not just in mild and moderate curves, but even in these severe curves, it's possible to get a good correction. So there is a solution to this worrying problem. But in your practice, at least in India and many parts of the world, we get a huge number of patients with severe curves like this. And then the question comes as to why does this happen and why do people keep away from surgery? Now, of course, that could be a late diagnosis in many parts of the world. The 
dresses and the attire that children wear sometimes camouflages the curves. It can be a lack of awareness, lack of medical facilities, but all these are there. But I think one of the most important things is this fear of surgery. So many of the patients whom we get have put off surgery for a few years with gross increase in curves. And this fear of surgery comes from all sources. I mean, friends, peers, elders, blogs, media, and sadly, sometimes physicians too, because many of them are still a few or few decades from that training and they tend to think of spine surgery still as unsafe as it was a few decades before. So what is this fear and why is this fear? Now we know that when you have a curve like this, Sukhan actually showed a lot of examples of what happens to the spine. It not only curves, but also rotates. And so you get this curve. Now correction of these essentially depends upon various techniques, but all of them centrally have the implanting of some titanium screws and rods, and there is some amount of derotation that gives them a good correction. Now, this actually is the reason why people fear about scoliosis surgery. Now, we know that the spinal column has got the spinal cord inside, which is the highway, which is connecting the brain and the nerves outside. So it takes all the commands from the brain down and also takes all the sensation from below to the brain. Now, people are worried about the spinal cord when you operate. Quite rightly so, because the spinal cord is within a small canal within the bone and the bone is also very close to major vessels and nerves and people worry. Now, if you have to put a screw through this bone, which is just five or six millimeters and then you put in a screw, it goes very close to the spinal cord and is very close to all the major vessels and people worry whether that could be a reason why you can get a hurt in the spinal cord or in the major vessels. So people also worry whether that is going to be an issue when you derotate the spine. It also, you lengthen the spine to some extent. Is the stretch of the cord going to give rise to this problem? And these are some things that happen. So the concerns are genuine, but I would like to say that there are so many advances in the last two decades that has made surgery very safe. The first and foremost is that you have a huge amount of advances. Now, starting with the diagnosis, advanced radiology, safe anesthesia, and spine microscopy. Now, these three things have made everything safe to start with. Now, we know this, when you have an advanced imaging, you have your diagnosis perfect. And so there are no surprises. You don't miss any intra-canal problems or any problems with the uh, spinal cord. And so this advanced radiology using MRI and CT helps us to understand the etiology and the curve and helps us to plan the surgery very well. Anesthesia has gone a long way. It is so safe now. Many hours of surgery is easily possible and very safely. There is very controlled hypotensive anesthesia whenever it is required and it has become so absolutely safe that surgeries are now much better. Now coming to the point where people feel that they are worried about placing the screws because the surgeon uses a lot of his judgment of anatomy and angles, I would like to say that even though there is a lot of rotation of these vertebrae in various sections of this curve, what has made this very safe is that there is a new technology that is now widely used called the intraoperative computer navigated technology. Now, this is almost like the same technology which allows the pilots to land exactly where they want, even on foggy days when the mission is very low. Now, this actually allows us to not only look at where we start, but it gives us a virtual image of where do you want to go, where are you going, and to the depth. And this is a virtual image. As you go in, you can actually see where is your screw, what is your relationship, where exactly you are. And that increases the safety quite a lot. Now, even in thin pedicles, quite deformed bone, it is quite easy for you to put an in out in technique or whatever technique that you want to use. You can use it very, very well. And that has increased 
a tremendous amount of safety when you use these uh, screws. Now we have done a lot of these studies and from world over and from our center also we have published that increases the safety of your screws to a great extent and you don't need no longer need to be pulled. The second is that when you are derotating the spine or you are stretching the cord, you have something called the intraop continuous spinal cord monitoring, which means that placing an electrode on the brain and then the peripheral areas of your this thing. You can continuously give uh, uh, electrode stimulation and then look at what is happening to the rest of the areas in the nerves, how the spinal cord is intact functionally and physiologically, that it is good in taking the motor sensation down and also taking the sensations that are from periphery up. Now, this is giving you a virtual second to second monitoring of the cord. And so you can be really sure that whatever maneuver you are doing is not hurting the cord in any way. The third is some of these surgeries involve a lot of uh, blood loss. And we now have the cell saver apparatus, which means that whatever is bleeding occurring from the patient, that can be collected, it can be filtered, and it can be processed, and then sent back to the patient, which really has reduced the amount of uh, blood transfusions that you require. So by all these things, you know that there is actually no need to fear surgery. And if any of your dear or near ones in the family have a scoliosis surgery, you should be quite happy. You can feel quite safe that all the facilities available in the modern surgery theater allows you to have a very surge, safe surgery for scoliosis. So thank you, Shogun, for this opportunity. And I would be happy to answer any of these questions. Thank you. Great, Raja. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of our panelists has a question for you. And uh, we'll go uh, on to the next talk. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Raj Shekharan, as usual, it was a fantastic uh, presentation and you really have allayed all apprehensions of people. Uh, can I ask you a question here or rather in your huge vast experience, what do you think the parents are mostly concerned with when a patient comes to you for scoliosis surgery, what is the most important concern you face for the patients and how, uh, what are your answers for that? Thank you for the question. And you know, it's just the short term uh, and then after the slowly it starts sinking in their mind, they also are thinking of long term. And the short term is the safety. I mean, they are told by everybody, their neighbors, uncle, aunt, grandmother, everybody pitches in with their free opinion that, you know, surgery in the spine is not safe. And uh, if you correct it, then it is going to have a big problem possibilities of paralysis every day. But what is really worrying is most of the children go to a physician and in fact to their elderly uh, pediatricians. And unfortunately, most of the elderly pediatricians have been trained about three or four decades before. And they always look at spine surgery as what they train at that time. And they give a false information to the patients that Okay, you can have the surgery after the growth is over because the parents are worried about growth disturbance after surgery and when the pediatrician tells them, I think it's better you have the surgery when you are 18 years old. Unfortunately, they take it as the words of Bible and then come at 18 years old with a very severe cut. So this is the main thing. Safety is at the first part. The second part is, you know, then most of the mothers start thinking about what happens to later in life what is going to be their married life, wedding, what is their activities, professional life, everything comes into it. So I think we need to actually increase the awareness that these surgeries are much safer. Roger, that's an excellent point. And you mentioned that um, perhaps getting a good baseline study and following the growth of that child where curve progression and skeletal maturity intersect may be well before they're done growing and actually quite soon after the growth spurt. And 90% um, of, of a child's spinal height is obtained right after 
their growth spurt. And so there's very little spinal height increase after that, but the curve could actually become quite severe and really change the nature of the surgery required and actually decrease the safety profile by waiting. Um, there's an, another question that uh, also is uh, quite dovetails your presentation. What precautions do you do for transitioning um, a child or an adolescent that you took care of to adulthood? Uh, for instance, many hospitals in the United States, like mine, after 21 years old, I can't see the children that I operated on five and 10 years ago. How do you handle that problem in India? And what do you recommend for an adolescent who's had surgery in terms of long-term follow-up? So Sukhan, you know about the Indian condition. So once they are your patient, then mostly they are your patients for life. So we don't have the uh, separation that once they cross the uh, childhood or the adolescent age by definition of, I mean, I know in different parts of the world, it's either 14, 16 or 18, that they can't see their original surgeons and they have to move over to that. Fortunately, in India is not like that. I can see Sneka even when she is 40 years old or if I am still alive. So that's not a big issue over here. And I think there is a big advantage on that because uh, the patient doctor rapport is so excellent. And uh, we can see and see them over there. So I see all my patients. I see patients now just two weeks before I saw a patient for a club foot a baby of a child whom I have operated about 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, these are all the sweet memories that you have in your profession. So yeah. we are fortunate that we don't need to discontinue on our patients. That's wonderful. And I, I know you didn't have time on your presentation, but we're getting several questions about lung function. Um, in your experience and based in the literature, what can we tell families and parents about improvement yeah. in lung function after treatment of scoliosis? So the lung function itself, as Sukhan mentioned uh, briefly in his talk, uh, is not a huge problem in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, where by the time you notice the curve and they are into their adolescence, the thoracic cage has not been severely disturbed during the most important period of life, uh, one to five years of life when the lung uh, maturation, it's also maturation and growth both together are not affected. So the lung function itself is a major problem in early onset scoliosis, especially very severe congenital scoliosis or very severe infantile scoliosis. So in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, only when the curve reaches beyond 100 or very severely distorted curves, you have a lung function. So people who have the first diagnosis after the age of eight or nine, I don't think you need to worry too much about the lung function if you're going to get it treated uh, very early. Now, in early onset scoliosis, it is a matter of great concern. And one of the reasons we want to intervene early in these people is to restore that thoracic shape and height so that the thoracic cage volume is pretty good. So once this improves, it allows the lungs to not only expand and grow, but also the number of alveoli maturation, what we call as the lung maturation also takes place. So the earlier the diagnosis takes place, especially if it is built before five years of age, then one of the chief concerns and one of the main reasons we want to operate is to expand the thorax and give space to the lung. Fortunately, in patients who are above the age of eight or nine, uh, lung or airway problem is not a major concern. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was a, a very comprehensive answer. And we'll now follow um, with uh, Dr. Abe Nene, who I consider a real renaissance type of surgeon. Uh, he's an excellent surgeon. He's uh, a fitness guru. He's involved in music. And he really enjoys his life outside of the hospital just as much as he enjoys taking care of children with scoliosis. Uh, he's from Mumbai at Lulavati Hospital. And will talk to us about the problem of India in terms of delayed diagnosis and non-operative treatment challenges that are sometimes prescribed to Indian patients. Abhay? Thank you so much, Suken. And um, uh, I must say that uh, we saw a world-class talk from uh, Dr. Rajshekaran. And uh, the, the cases that you saw, 
I mean, all of us would agree that uh, there are very few surgeons on in this uh, whole wide world who would be able to handle such cases. So really, India has the expertise to deliver top-notch um, care for scoliosis. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is that India is a land of contrasts. And when you look at, uh, you know, high rises on one end, you still have the bottom of the pyramid that uh, kind of crowds up uh, the Indian space. And um, uh, my brief is to really give you the, this dark side of the problem where, um, you know, the reason really why uh, we're stuck uh, with this problem of scoliosis. If you look, if you just uh, glance through India's health problems, I mean, uh, we are talking of diarrheal diseases, uh, respiratory infections. It's very basic stuff. It's stuff that uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, reduce infant mortality and uh, perinatal mortality. And that kind of stuff uh, doesn't really, uh, you know, make any room for scoliosis to come up uh, in terms of uh, the public eye or even the eye of the legislation. And uh, hence, there's a huge problem of, uh, uh, you know, of treating scoliosis in India. The problem of delayed diagnosis revolves around, uh, of course, the lack of awareness because the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. And um, I mean, this kind of depicts uh, literal, literally and figuratively uh, that the eyes really don't see because uh, Indian traditional clothes tend to cover up the torso in a way that uh, scoliosis doesn't get recognized, you know, outside of the family. And uh, even the family uh, tends to turn a blind eye. And uh, it's uh, the, 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 you know, most, most scoliosis surgeons in India would agree that uh, girls come, uh, you know, come seeking treatment closer to the, you know, time of their um, uh, so-called arranged marriages, which is, you know, well past the, the 20, uh, 20 age mark. And that's too late. And uh, that's simply because uh, the scoliosis has not been noticed by the, by the friends or the peers of the, of the patient because of the kind of uh, clothing we wear. And of course, the mind is not aware. So we, we are not looking for scoliosis because we are not aware of scoliosis because of the general apathy in the country and, um, you know, uh, um, be because the way we are, we are living our life in the country, I mean, India is largely a, um, a, a rural uh, state. I mean, it's more than 70% of India uh, lies in the rural population. And unlike uh, some of the Western counterparts, rural India is really struggling in terms of resources, though things are rapidly changing. And I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been a, uh, you know, a sea change in the way the, uh, the overall the standard of living in the country is coming up. Uh, in the rural population, there is a general lack of awareness for sure. And uh, in fact, I, I say this even in the urban population, and there's a popular slide that Dr. Menon continues to show where um, the top, uh, the front page of a magazine suggested that heavy school bags are the cause of scoliosis. Uh, most people feel that scoliosis is really not scoliosis. It's just that the kid is lazy and lackluster when she sits in front of the screen. And then there is the myth about uh, scoliosis being a curse from God. And uh, that myth actually uh, transcends um, cultures. Uh, you know, we have the ancient curse of uh, Kubja, the, the lady with the, the first lady <laughs> they described with scoliosis, who was actually treated with traction by Lord Krishna. And uh, it's, it's uh, even now suggested that if you have scoliosis, you're a cursed, um, you know, evil being or, uh, you know, a, 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 a demon of sorts. And people tend to, uh, you know, neglect any kind of treatment. Uh, as far as school screening is concerned, which becomes the cornerstone to actually diagnose scoliosis early. Uh, again, you can see that when you look at the handbook given by the Ministry of Health uh, of the country, uh, operational guidelines for school health under the Ayushman Bharat scheme, and that's the 2018 edition, which is the 2018 edition, which is a newer one. It still talks of deworming, um, malnutrition, anemia, uh, vision issues, infectious diseases. So. The top of the heap is um, life-saving issues with the kids and uh, really screening for scoliosis does not tend to feature in our school screening programs. Uh, leave alone prenatal diagnosis. I mean, uh, the, the figures in India are stra uh, you know, st staggering. India has the highest number of children with birth defects for the obvious reasons of uh, malnutrition and uh, you no know, poor prenatal hygiene. And uh, approximately one in 33 infants have birth defects and it should not be so hard to pick up spinal uh, birth defects on in the first trimester of screening and uh, you know treat them at the helm but um, uh, the the problem here is that when you look at the indian data less than one in four pregnant uh, lady has even one ultrasound done through her pregnancy so leave alone getting an early prenatal diagnosis you're talking of you know not even getting a, a very very basic ultrasound done throughout your pregnancy through the delivery and that is uh, 
you know, that's something that puts paid to our hopes of early diagnosis. Having said that, our uh, parent association, the Association of Spine Surgeons of India, uh, again, led by stalwarts like Dr. Raj Shekharan and Dr. Samajit Basu, um, uh, we have launched a program of early diagnosis in schools, and this is fast picking up. Dr. Chhabra and Dr. Shankar Achary, the current president, have uh, spearheaded this movement. And we made videos uh, that have been circulated across the, you know, across the schools, and a lot of willing uh, you know, school admins have come forward and uh, the school screening program has truly taken off, but uh, the results uh, would take some time indeed. What about non-operative treatment, which really revolves around early diagnosis because um, uh, the non-operative treatment of scoliosis is best done when you have the child up and early. Um, because we have a problem of early diagnosis, uh, you know, again, non-operative treatment doesn't really come to the come to pass. But then we have casting and bracing, which also, um, you know, uh, are used in uh, curves that are early, that are soft, that are supple, and not curves that present late. And uh, like you saw from Dr. Raja's slides, uh, and most of us keep seeing at our at the hospitals where we work, most kids come in with really horrendous deformities, and uh, there is no question of non-surgical treatment in these kids. Uh, kids who come in early would uh, definitely benefit with exercises, physical therapy. Uh, you know, all forms of um, uh, targeted uh, exercise programs, sometimes bracing and in the real small kids casting, but that does not seem to work. And again, in Dr. Raja's own words, uh, India falls uh, woefully short of specialists. So even if you find a kid who has an early onset scoliosis, for that kid to reach out to the appropriate caregiver becomes a huge problem. And uh, uh, we are probably 10% uh, uh, of the, the specialty surgeons uh, uh, compared to a modern country and um, uh, you know to access this healthcare is very hard for a child with early onset scoliosis and as far as bracing and casting is concerned we have all sorts of problems our um, uh, humid and hot uh, weather uh, precludes uh, using casts and uh, people are not compliant with casts um, uh, even braces for that matter kids tend to grow out of their braces very fast and they need quick changes and that involves multiple trips to the uh, scoliosis expert, which is difficult because they come from rural backgrounds or villages. And just getting back, getting to the cities to get their uh, caste change is a problem. And of course, the cost involved, not only in the transit, but even in the uh, care, uh, becomes very difficult. And, uh, you know, these are kids that have, the ones that I've shown on the screen are kids that have suffered because of uh, poor compliance rather than because of, um, you know, lack of awareness. So um, I'm here trying to highlight all the problems that we have uh, with scoliosis surgery in India because we can't have early diagnosis and because the role of non-operative treatment becomes so limited. Having said that, um, I think um, it's webinars like these and associations like ours, uh, the Setting Scoliosis Straight Organization, which goes straight to the public and tries to open the public eye on uh, the problem of scoliosis, uh, will, uh, we, we will give solutions for this and hopefully uh, you know, we'll find our local methods to overcome the problem, which is so global and so, uh, you know, so universal and yet so innate to our country. And uh, thank you to, uh, to, to the organization uh, that, uh, you know, we are slowly uh, kicking, uh, let, set, letting the ball roll in this big wide field of uh, problems in uh, scoliosis treatment in India. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abhay. We'll take a question from our panel. And then there's a question in the chat that I'd like to direct towards you. So Abhay, uh, thank you. Great talk as usual. You know, you started with the words bottom of the pyramid and also told about awareness. So in your practice and your opinion, what do you think is actually uh, deterring people from coming at the right time? Do you think it's uh, cost, uh, lack of finance or lack of awareness? Um, so I think it's a combination of three things. Of course, lack of awareness is number one because they don't even see the scoliosis. But it's also the uh, you know the entire burden revolving around getting the child from you know from a remote place to a large city. Uh, how do you house the child? How do you house the uh, the parents? Uh, what sort of cost is going to be involved uh, in the treatment? And uh, then the you know the the med uh, the mediators involved. Uh, you know the local doctors, so to say, who tend to say that. Uh, there's no treatment for scoliosis or you got to wait like someone in the chat box mentioned some you're asked to wait till you're a teenage late teenager and uh, you know there's no correct counseling and when it comes from a healthcare professional it uh, gets interpreted as the truth and uh, even though there is a willingness to go to a city to get their problem sorted 
uh, they they really don't reach out. So the solution, in my opinion, is to to for us to reach out to them. And our Spine Foundation has been doing that for the last two decades now. That uh, you know we go to small remote villages and we are actually doing scoliosis surgery uh, in remote villages and uh, doing it at a very low cost and uh, you know taking the fear out of people. And your best uh, ambassador is going to be a patient who's been treated by you in a village, in a setting in that village. And that seems to be, uh, you know, percolating across the, across the, uh, the populace. Yeah, Thank I'm you, really aware um, of the good work you're doing. Congratulations on that. Thank you, Abhay. You know, you touched on, um, on fears. And um, we sometimes see that uh, some people are in denial because they don't want to know actually what's going on. And Catherine asked an excellent question. We talked about the parents' fears and expectations and how to manage that through education. But what about a child? Um, in your experience, what are they afraid of and how do you manage that? Who else on your team can help uh, prepare the child for surgery? Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, you know, I, we, were, we were raised in spine surgery, talking to parents about the kid's surgery. But today in 2020 in Bombay City, um, it's a sin if you do not talk to the child straight up because the children are so well versed. And I had a girl coming and saying, you know, I don't want that Harrington rod in my pack, like a little teenage girl saying that. So I think it's of paramount importance to give credit to the child's intelligence and IQ and requirements and wants. And personally, I feel there's no one better. I mean, aside of the surgeon talking straight to the kid, there's no one better than another girl who's had a scoliosis surgery before. Um, talk to the kid. And luckily, we made this scoliosis, Friends of Scoliosis um, uh, group on Facebook. And um, I normally refer the kid to the, you know, there, and they make their own arrangement. There is some, uh, some uh, girls who are cagey because, you know, in India, disclosing that the fact that you've had a scoliosis surgery can also come with a lot of uh, uh, poor bandwidth. So, um, uh, but there are, there are girls who help and they kind of meet privately and talk in private about uh, what they went through. And I think that is the best uh, shot in the arm for the girl uh, to go through with her uh, treatment for scoliosis. That's fantastic advice. Thank you. Yeah, we have similar patient mentors that we call them that help other families. Excellent. Thank you, Abhay. Um, now I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Samyajit Basu. Uh, he's also a member of the Scoliosis Research Society and is now in charge of a worldwide education effort for the society. And we're pleased to have him as a guest on this webinar. He practices at Kotari Hospital in Kolkata and is the incoming president of the Association of Spinal Surgeons of India. Uh, and tonight he's gonna to talk to us about post-op and follow-up care following scoliosis surgery in India. Basu? I'll just share my screen. Right, and as you're getting ready, I wanna remind our audience that you can submit questions through the Q&A, which our panelists will answer live uh, either via the text or through this uh, webinar. Is my screen visible and am I audible? Yes, perfect. So thanks again for the nice introduction and I would take this opportunity to thank everybody who set this webinar up because this is a patient education webinar and something which actually should be done more frequently and I'm grateful to Setting Scoliosis Trait Foundation for making, making this happen. So I'm interested to talk about the post-op and follow-up care in, in India. And as you're all aware by this time that scoliosis is a huge spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, we have the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, the cause of which is not very known. And it is the commonest and the safest surgery. And congenital scoliosis is a more difficult surgery, more so if it is neglected as Abhay and Dr. Raj Shekhar has pointed it out. And of course, there are a few unfortunate kids who have neuromuscular problems and it is rarely practiced because of unawareness and possible neglect. On the other hand, we have early onset scoliosis in which really young kids come up with bent spines, crooked spines. And of course, we have a hugely increasing burden of the geriatric population. And as you're aware, many of them would develop spinal deformities in adult spinal deformity is a real challenge in the coming years. Now, uh, you cannot compare this child who's had a surgery for an adolescent idiopathic scoliosis with hardly a five or six level instrumentation to somebody like this, 
who has had a hugely bent spine, a neuromuscular wheelchair bound person who has had this extensive two staged surgery to make him a better sitter. As you can see, he became a very good sitter because before surgery, he was hardly able to sit. So what about pain control in the hospital? So that is one of the foremost concerns about post-operative care of these patients that doctor, am I going to have severe pain? Am I going to be tossing about in bed after the, after the surgery? Can I lie straight on my back or do I have to lie prone? So usually the patients will have several attachments like monitors and IV lines and a drain pipe. But by the second day, most of these attachments are out. And by the third day, usually the IV channel is also out because the oral medications have started. Now, parents ask me what to eat and drink. Usually food and beverages can be consumed in a day or two and fluids given intravenously would be stopped after the stomach moves. Now there is also a lot of apprehension regarding what happens to the huge incision from top to bottom. Firstly, it is not always a top to bottom surgery on the back. It might be a very small surgery, for example, in a kid who has an extra bone and that needs to be removed only. It's not a big surgery or not a big incision, but a large bandage is usually, which is called a surgical dressing, will cover the incision wound. And the bulky dressing is converted to smaller dressing by the time the parents go home. This is an adult who underwent a scoliosis surgery involving the lower half of the spine. And as you can see that she goes back home with a well-corrected spine, the bulky dressing, but just before going home, it's changed over to smaller one. So the standard question which comes up for all patients is when do I move her out? And over the last five to 10 years, as you can point it out, we've been very aggressive in mobilizing these patients out of bed early. Within a day or two, they are up and about. And it is normal for the patient to be hesitant or fearful before attempting to get out of bed for the first time. And they might feel a little bit dizzy, but with the physios coming in and with the other caregivers, especially the nursing staff, cajoling them into a standing position, they do feel better. Small amounts of moving around and walking will be important for starting the process of strengthening the back muscles. And they're encouraged to get out of bed as early as possible. So ultimately, when is he or she ready to return home? In our hospital, we have the four markers or the four targets for discharge, getting in and out of bed without help, moving about in the corridor, improvement in walking, they eat solid foods, and the wound behaves fine without any signs of leakage or infection. So as I was telling you, this patient who had an extra bone in the spine led to a very deformed spine. But for this patient, the incision is small, as you can see. And if you can see the preoperative and the postoperative pictures, this is a small surgery. And the success of the surgery depends, if it is, depends on the fact that it was picked up early. And if you pick up early, these patients can be saved of major surgeries. So next, once they go back home, when do I come back first? Usually in our setup, we send an OT technician to the home if it is within a reasonable distance from the hospital. And within 10 to 14 days, the OT tech visits them and checks up the wound. If there is a suture, it's removed and a healthy wound is the first check post of recovery at home. They're encouraged to gradually resume normal activities at home and all apprehensions are addressed with the surgeon or the physical medicine specialist who also reinforces the exercise protocols. So next is the first visit, one or four weeks post-surgery. In the first one, of one to two weeks, they're allowed to take a bath, though swimming should still be avoided. They do go out with friends in the, in the campus within a couple of weeks, but riding in vehicles is usually discouraged unless it's extremely necessary because the potholes and the bumps in the road can be painful. 
the myth that no bending, no lifting, no twisting. I think it's time that we dispose of these myths, especially after a couple of weeks or four weeks. And you can see this patient is bending forward. And the common myth that surgery would stiffen up the spine is an absolute uh, something which should be discouraged and should be dispensed of as early as possible. These patients do bend forwards as normally. Of course, if your entire spine is fixed, like in some of these pathologies which come up very rarely, there is a little bit of movement restriction, but most of the movement of bending down comes from the hips and the pelvic bones, which is never affected. So at about a month, the first follow-up is done to assess surgical healing at the fitness level of the patient. In our clinic, we do, the, do see them about four weeks after surgery. That means about three weeks or three and a half weeks after they go back home. And typically the patients of school going age are encouraged to join school within three to four weeks, but the physical training classes might have to be avoided initially. Those who are in a job usually get a joining permission. At 12 weeks, a further x-ray is taken and all activities are encouraged, including non-contact non sports, athletics, et cetera. I do encourage all my patients to go back to dance classes if they have one prior to surgery. And if they're in athletics, they should take a run or a jog within a month or one and a half months. Now, as uh, Sukhan was pointing out, long-term follow-up is extremely important. The first follow-up after three months in which they get an X-ray is at 12 months when the X-rays are again taken and return to normal activities are reinforced without any restrictions. They can go back to contact sports. They can go back to all sorts of uh, amusement parks for rides and monkey jumping and full contact sports are allowed. Now, for example, this patient would have a small limitation of activity for entire bending forwards or wearing the socks. She might have to sit a little bit to one side for putting on her socks, but that is what is important to realize that this long surgery would have been avoided. Though she has an excellent cosmetic outcome, these long surgeries should be avoided and they could be avoided if they are picked up earlier on. So this patient's parents came to us when the patient was in a marriageable age. And in spite of the fact that the, the parents know that this child has a deformity from adolescence, from 13 years age, and he was extensively counseled about the fact that 90% of the truncal growth of the spine is completed by 13 years. She did not undergo surgery until unless she came to a marriageable age and she had to undergo a long surgery. Long-term follow-up, it's imperative. And I do encourage all my patients to visit once a year till adulthood is reached. And after skeletal growth is over, they're encouraged to come in at least a couple of years or three, four years. And they are absolutely elated to see me once they are uh, adult, adults. I've seen my patients going back to work. I have, uh, now have more than 10 year follow-ups of these patients and they are so much elated to see us and see back, go back to the hospital. And we must obviously realize that gives good, good reassurance to patients in the long term. And it is the relationship with the surgeon and the patient which lives longer than the surgery. Thanks for your attention. Great, thank you very much, very much Basu. Um, any questions uh, from our panelists? Amijit, can I have a, that the first shot? It was a lovely, elaborate talk, and it really, uh, you know, spelled out uh, step by step what uh, a parent or a child can expect after scoliosis surgery. Um, I just wanted to echo what all kids want to know because they're typically dandy young kids and they want to go back to sport. And um, we again, we were grown up with the myth that uh, after scoliosis you can't get back to sport. Can you uh, elaborate your thoughts on return to sports? Like, how many of your patients have literally gone back to active sports or dance, and uh, what are your thoughts about it after school use surgery? Thanks, Abha. It was a, a really good question because at least 80% of my patients, especially the adolescent age group, as you correctly pointed out, they're not actually kids. They're miniature adults. They have their thinking process. They have their rationale of treatment completely studied into them. And I do encourage all of them to have a chat, as you, all, you also mentioned, you have a chat with somebody who had this surgery 
and especially if he or she is a dancer, I do uh, connect him across to a patient who've had a scoliosis surgery and who has gone back to dancing, who's gone back to contact sports. At least one third of my patients do go, get back to sports. Many of them would go back to badminton, table tennis. I have had one patient who went back to rugby. I have had one patient who, uh, who was an absolute, uh, uh, who's absolutely crazy for these amusement parks and he or sh uh, he, he would just uh, revel out at any of these amusement parks. So they do all go back to very high level uh, activities. And I assured them that all of them is, all of this is possible and possible in the short term, within the next three to six months, they're up and about to all these activities. Excellent, that's very encouraging for our young patients and their families. Um, in a prelude to um, Momita Ghosh's next talk on SMA, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat uh, related to SMA. Um, so Basu, I just have to ask you uh, two quick questions. Um, with regard to neuromuscular scoliosis, we didn't talk much about the preoperative workup. For AIS, it seems pretty standard. We get our x-rays and bending films and uh, some photographs perhaps and the SRS outcomes questionnaire. How is the workup preoperatively for neuromuscular scoliosis different? Do you do any lung function studies? Do you do any bone density studies? Uh, what other preoperative workup uh, do you do for those patients? And can you briefly comment on uh, treatment of SMA scoliosis? Because we're seeing a lot of questions in the, in the chat box. Well, thanks again for uh, coming up with this. And uh, as you yourself are aware, having worked in children's hospital for uh, so many years, uh, SMA is an important uh, neuromuscular scoliosis, which comes up with the spinal deformity and the percentage of patients who have uh, deformities, spinal deformities in SMA is nearly uh, 80 to 90% other than those very few lucky ones who have very, uh, uh, very smooth disease, shall we say, or very early uh, detection. And now that we have some very good medications, there are, uh, there is a hope that in future, the percentage of scoliosis would come down. But having said that, the neuromuscular kids are a completely different ball game from the adolescent kids because they are uh, not that much fit patients. They are ill and they are ill not only from the neuromuscular point of view, they have thoracic problems, they have, they have frequent chest infections so that monitoring the chest function, the pulmonary function is critically important. Secondly, uh, many of them have nutritional problems and these nutritional problems, especially malnutrition is an issue they have to be addressed and a proper specialist and a dietitian needs to be roped in. And uh, thirdly, from malnutrition, as well as the lack of activities, these bones are typically weaker and they are osteoporotic, which means that the purchase of screws might not be adequate. For, these, uh, for this, a routine bone density checking preoperatively is mandatory. And we do have some special screws which needs to be put, uh, pulled in when we are doing these surgeries. And finally, it is, the, it, is the, it is the most pious task of the specialist to involve the parents from a very early age. These parents must not think that these children have no hope and despair is written on the wall. These children are excellent uh, people. I mean, I have had the opportunity to interact with the SMA kids. And thanks to Momita, we have an SMA foundation up and about. And these kids are exceptionally talented. They are very good painters. They're very good singers. And they are uh, so beautiful kids to talk with. So they must be counseled about the fact that your sitting balance is going to be uh, much improved. Their parents need to understand and their apprehensions and anxiety needs to be traced to understand that the scoliosis surgery makes their life of the kid much better. Thanks again for pointing this out. Absolutely. Um, there's several other questions in the Q&A box, so I'll, I'll defer to you to answer those uh, in the Q&A. But you mentioned that, uh, and I find that very common in, in certain other syndromic conditions such as osteogryposis and osteogenesis imperfecta, the body and the skeleton may be um, devastated with the orthopedic conditions, but cognitively they are very far advanced and, and really deserve to be heard. So thanks very much for that. Um, our next guest, Momita Ghosh from the Cure SMA Foundation, some really exciting work coming out uh, of SMA and a very noted Indian entrepreneur, uh, basically self-funded uh, drug treatment for SMA intrathecally uh, throughout the world. So. We'd like to welcome 
Uh, Momita. Thank you. Thank you, Sikhi. So uh, I'm Momita Ghosh, co-founder and director here at SME Foundation of India. It is a parent-led organization, uh, mostly run by parents and self-funded, as you said, and works for the welfare of individuals suffering from spinal muscular atrophy. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity by taking Scoliosis Straight Foundation uh, because in uh, SMA children, uh, the children who are affected with spinal muscular atrophy, scoliosis is a major complication, and as Dr. Basu said that almost all children suffer from scoliosis and there's a lot of um, uh, lack of awareness and needs and fear that children, uh, most of the children do not go for scoliosis study. So I, I will briefly share uh, my journey. I will briefly share my journey with uh, scoliosis uh, because uh, my journey with scoliosis starts with my daughter who is 11 year old and who is also suffering from spinal muscular atrophy and um, she 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 is uh, di she was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy at one year of old and uh, as this muscular atrophy uh, i'm just telling briefly that a portion of spinal nerves get atrophied and which controls all the muscles of the body and muscles are majorly mostly hypotonic and they are not able to hold the spine straight so spine start bending as they grow up. So we noticed uh, the bending of spine in my daughter when she was four years of old and um, we immediately uh, discussed with her neurologist who is a pediatric neurologist with neuromuscular specialization. And then uh, we did a whole spine X-ray and we found that she has mild scoliosis of 10 to 12 degree. And she suggested us to use spinal braces. But as you know, uh, all the parts of India is not well uh, infrastructured to deal with this conditions, this orthosis, this braces, and all these things. Oh, what uh, we used a brace which was not rigid one, and within six months, when we went to see our doctor next time, her scoliosis increased to 22 degree. And doctor was furious, and she suggested us to immediately go for the Boston braces, and that was the first time we learned there are some rigid braces, Boston braces that need to be used for eight to ten hours uh, of uh, day uh, religiously, and it, it's very difficult in a country like us hot and humid to wear these braces and doing go, going to school and doing all the activities so uh, you know my daughter is very compliant very understanding very intelligent she understood her condition that wearing braces will stop or at least stabilize the progression of her scoliosis and she uh, used to wear I means we did not need to you know force her or something like that she was very compliant and uh, along with this my learning goes so um, as our foundations are already there so I shared my learning with uh, other parents and we start you know uh, create some awareness activities, awareness webinars uh, to create awareness among the parents that scoliosis, uh, scoliosis ne needs to be picked up early, that sitting posture, wearing braces are important. And uh, uh, thankfully, I was guided by a very good doctor who, as soon as her scoliosis was diagnosed, she started taking care of her bone health. We did her calcium test, uh, vitamin D test, bone density test. That was annually and six monthly. And also lung function test. All these things were going side by side. Means she explained that in future she might need scoliosis surgery. So kind of we are being mentally prepared since her diagnosis it was the most uh, uh, wonderful thing that helped uh, uh, me to take decision of her scoliosis surgery. So, uh, uh, so you know, uh, as she was uh, nearing, uh, my uh, my daughter uh, is a patient of Dr. Basu. So we used to go to uh, check up annually and uh, to see her spine, and uh, her spine was flexible and she was sitting well. So you know, every time we are getting a little more time to delay the surgery, and we were waiting for her to grow up. 
so suddenly this growth spurt happened and she her height increased her weight increased and scoliosis suddenly become from moderate to severe almost 100 and we were uh, you know had to go for scoliosis surgery and as i say that we are kind of you know mentally prepared since long that yes we'll have to go for surgery so it did not took much time to you know fi finalize the decision that we'll go for surgery so we consulted her pulmonologist her pediatricians we taken the vaccines you know lungs of uh, sma children are very weak so they need to take care of lungs very well so we did uh, flu vaccines pneumonia vaccines and we used to uh, 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 she used to uh, use bipap you know for lung uh, so that her lungs are you know well enough to go for this long hours of surgery and finally in september 21 uh, she has undergo two stage surgery Uh, under Dr. Pasu's care, and yes, it was very difficult uh, for parents to, you know, uh, see uh, your child in pain going through that such major surgeries. But definitely, it worked because we have seen children who has not undergone surgery that compromise their quality of life. I have seen them in pain and how their, uh, you know, lung is. severely compromised because of scoliosis so it it is very important to take the decision at right time and go the surgery so as a foundation cure sma foundation of india we are take, uh, doing lot of awareness webinars with the help of the doctors and we are or the scams because you know as uh, dr nene said it's a financial burden to the parents you know uh, changing the spinal braces uh, six monthly annually those are very expensive and scoliosis surgery itself in india is beyond the reach of the middle income group so that is another uh, uh, another hurdle or uh, burden we are trying to address with um, so you know uh, but still i, I think awareness is most important and understanding parents is most important that we must take the right decision at right time because you know once the surgery is done seeing the child without braces after so many years sitting tall straight smiling it's really worth all the pain and all the pain we have gone through the years so my daughter you know she 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 was really happy when she could sit straight without uh braces okay well no me that's a that's a long story i'm sorry did you have more no thank you thank you it's almost all over <laughs> so she just from the picture she seems very satisfied with the surgery as well yeah yeah absolutely and uh, uh, thanks to dr barsu she i think she wrote three four mails with lot many questions i think 20 25 questions to dr barsu and he was patient enough to answer all those questions before she undergone surgery and it was her decision that you now finally he's a very surgery. patient man um basu there's a couple of other questions in the chat about sma and i know we can't generalize with the various types and the various ages and angles but i think people um we just wanted some guidance about uh curve magnitude age and sma type when do you approach surgery so this cannot be a a single answer for because every patient is different but um be aware of the growth spurt in adolescence and start bracing early so that uh, you can delay surgery at least till the growth spurt is done but remember that if the curve spins off beyond 90 or 100 degrees curve angle that is something sometimes uh, where you have to intervene that is most important that you should be on a regular follow up with a specialist and uh, raja we talked a lot about spinal fusion surgery as a definitive treatment for scoliosis but there's a question in the q and a about growing rods uh, what's uh, what can you tell us about that the current status of that technology uh, raja or abhay do you want to answer that All right. Um, I mean, Abai, uh, do you want to take it or? Uh, no, no, I'm going for you to take it. Yeah. Okay. So you know, one of the primary concerns about scoliosis surgery is that very often a large number of segments are fused, and uh, 
it's okay if the child has already crossed 10 years, as Sukhan initially said, by that time, most of the spinal growth is over and whatever you lose, the very little you lose, but you more than have a gain for it by when you straighten the spine, the children are more taller. In fact, one of the first things which most of the children love after the spine surgery is they always say in the first two or three days of post-operative period, I'm almost one to one and a half inches taller. So that age group is not a problem. But if you're operating on the very young, like three-year-old or six-year-old, then you don't want to fuse the large segment of spines. And there you have a good uh, <clears throat> a new technique, or it's a old technique, but it's a, where you put in a rod at the top, you get a fixation points at the top and fixation points at the bottom. And then you connect it with the rod, which is not exposing the spines in between, spinal segments in between. You pass this through the subfacial or submuscular plane. And then every six months, it varies, but generalizing it's about five to six months. You can, there are many techniques by which you just make a very small incision and you can elongate the whole apparatus, the construct so that it does keep up with the growth and you can keep this going till the child reaches 10 or 11 years of age when a definitive surgery can be done you have two types of this growing rods one is the magnetic growing rods which has just come into uh, normal usage for the last few years uh, you don't need to do interventional surgery every six months but there is a magnetic apparatus and the method by which you can slowly make it grow uh, by just placing uh, a control apparatus at the top of the skin, overlying the skin. The other one is the manual where you need to do a small surgery every six months and make it grow. Now, both these are very useful. It has its plus and negative points, but they are a big boon when you have to operate on children who are four to five years of age. Great, thank you. Um, Abey, anything to add on that? Um, when should you convert from your non-operative treatment such as bracing to need surgery? Do you have just a quick guideline on something like that? I think it's a race between growth and uh, growth, of, growth of the child and the growth of the curve. And it's uh, about surgeon skills also. So I, I would like to stretch my you know, non-operative treatment to move to surgery as late as possible while I can still correct the curve. So there's no, I think it's a blurred line, but uh, that's the best answer I can give. Right, but the key principle is following that patient with routine x-rays and surveillance, not going away and coming back when the child's fully grown. We need routine follow-up for that. Well, I, I really want to thank our panelists, uh, Abey, Raja, and Basu for uh, some amazing content. And certainly our uh, patient ambassador and our uh, family ambassadors for giving us a real um, look at the other side of the curtain, as we like to say, to really hopefully give you reassurance that treatment of scoliosis in India is certainly safe and effective and would be a great option for many of the patients throughout the world. Um, I want to thank you for attending this webinar sponsored by the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation. And if you're grateful that this event was important in your education and understanding of scoliosis, uh, I would urge you to uh, give to the cause uh, as much or little as you would like, either through the website www.settingscoliosisstraight.org or by texting scoliosis to 41444 uh, and going to the website to really see what other content, patient testimonials and education we have. There are also other ways to support Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation and that's through Amazon Smile. If you direct the foundation as the benefactor of your purchases on Amazon, 0.5% of your purchases will go to the Setting Scoliosis Straight Foundation. So sign up today. And finally, special thanks to our sponsors. Without our corporate partners, we could not pull off events like this and do the great research that we do to help patients long into the future. We have upcoming patient educational events, four more international webinars this year. Uh, so visit our website for more information and to learn more about scoliosis in general. Um, you'll get a survey about this webinar. And in order to make this better, we need your feedback. So please submit your comments and suggestions for making this educational event better in the future for other patients and families. I wanna thank you very much, our sincere gratitude for being here, and I wish you uh, an excellent, healthy year ahead. <laughs>